Well, welcome to our uh, class on Mora Nebuchem, on Guide for the Perplexed, or Guide of the Perplexed. And uh, I think this is lecture 98, I think. Um, and uh, if I'm wrong, that's fine, whatever. But, um, and we just finished last week, chapter 13 in part three. And for those, we were, it was page 456 in the Shlomo Pines uh, version. Um, we're about to start chapter 14. I did make a promise last week. I, I got a little, uh, I, I, that I would explain a little bit the, the ending of, of the previous chapter. So I should start there. And um, so we really, let's turn back to 455. Thus it is made clear. Um, but I'm going to actually, uh, instead of reading that paragraph, which I read last time, but I kind of did a couple points that I didn't catch. I'm going to paraphrase it in my own words. So, um, the Rambam there is actually discussing several psukim in the book of Eov, in the book of Job, uh, Eov. And the one is from Eov Parag Dalid, where it says, Hain be'avadov lo yamin, which uh, can roughly translate as, Behold, the God does not trust in his servants, uvamalachav, and in his angels, yasim tahala. He, he finds flaws. Af shochne bate chomer. So, in other words, if that's the case with God's uh, angels, then the next verse reads, Af shochne bate chomer, asher uh, then those who, uh, for, so how much more so those that reside in houses made of clay, in other words, made of dirt, asher ba'afari so dumb, that those, in other words, human beings, their foundation is made of dirt, yidak um ash, and they are just crushed in front of like a, 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 like a, a moth, uh, you know, the flying kind of moth. So, so um, there's various ways to translate that verse, but that's the basics. And then he he also read uh, went to um, um, uh, another verse which is um, uh, in Eov uh, Perak Tes Vav um, uh, verse fifteen and sixteen. So so it says again it says Hain Biktoshav Lo Yamin. It's similar language to before, but this time he uses the language Hain Biktoshav, and before it was Hain Ba'avadav, right? So God has no trust in his holy ones. And even the heavens are not pure in his eyes. Um, behold, so much, how much more so is the human being who is disgusting or, and, 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 and small. The person drinks iniquity or sin like water. So, so the, the bottom line of that last paragraph was the Ramam said that what is... What, who are these Kedoshav? Who are these Avadav? Who are these Malachav? These high lofty ones? They are, as Ramam has repeatedly stated many times, the, the spheres of the heavens and the intelligences, so to speak, that, that run those spheres. Hold on, I got to plug in my computer before I lose power. I'm sorry. About to go dead. All right, this is better. And, um, and and what and what God is saying, but what what the verses are saying there, according to Rambam, is that God has no. He when he says that he has no trust in his in his angels, what he means is because they're physical created beings, right? Those angels that are lofty and high are created beings, are created of substance, right? Of some sort of substance, just like we are, and even those intelligences of the angels that run those. That, that run those spheres that rotate around the world are also created beings. So they're not permanent. They don't exist. In other words, if you took Aristotle's idea, right, which was that, uh, which was what modern scientists, uh, an atheist scientist would say, right, that things exist because the laws of nature dictate that that's how it should be, right? So then all of those beings, the spheres that rotate around the earth, right, um, uh, would be, would be uh, created. Um, there because they have to be there because the, the rules of nature dictate that that's how they should be, like Aristotle would have said as well. So, but Rambam is saying, no, all of those things are created, right? So, and they're, they're lofty high things up there, right? And even those are, are nothing before God. And we who are so small and tiny in comparison to them, right? Both in terms of our level of in, intellect, and in terms of our level of the kind of matter that we're made up of, are so puny and so small. And physically measurably small, where, how much more so are we nothing, right? Are we, uh, so, so and, and then emphasizing then therefore, and he's going to emphasize it, continue into this in the chapter we're about to start today, 
Therefore, it can't possibly be, we are not the purpose of the universe, right? The human being, as small as we are, are not the purpose of the universe. Now, so, so the Ramam, you know, did said that emphatically throughout chapter 13, which we spent the last two weeks on. He's going to continue on the topic in chapter 14. Um, however, I want to uh, mention that, that, you know, the Ramam he here, he's devoting two chapters and two long chapters to this idea in large part because he's refuting, right, a very prevalent idea among religious philosophers. Okay, so and, and specifically, he's, atta he's attacking Rabbi Nusad Yagon, who writes in Amonus, in Amonus Udeo. So he, the, the, Sad Yagon lived uh, like a couple centuries before the Rambam, and he was the first major Jewish uh, scholar to write a book on Jewish philosophy, and that was his Sefer Amonus Udeo. In there, he posits that the purpose of creation is for the human being to use it in order to worship God. And I'm sure that pretty much all of the people listening here today and whoever listens to the recording has heard that being stated at some point in their lifetime of listening to religious discourses, uh, that the Ramam is, is attacking that idea, directly attacking that idea, and he's attacking Sajigon. And also the, another famous book that, that, that preceded the Ramam, although I don't think the Ramam if he was aware of it, I don't know if there's any place where he quotes it. It's it's the famous Chovo Talavavot, or The Duties of the Heart, written by Bachia ibn Pakuda, who, who died just a, a decade or so before the Ramam was born in the similar in the same region of Spain. So um, so it's I don't know, and he was also a, a, a well to some degree an Aristotelian or Neoplatonist, whatever, but uh, Bachim Hukuda wrote uh, Duties of the Heart, which is the one of the first major works on Jewish ethics and, and how to live a moral life. But he it's also a work of philosophy. And in that book, uh, Rebbeinu Bachia takes the position that also that the world is here to serve man and the purpose of all of the, the kingdoms, you know, the animals, plants, and so on, is here to serve us, right? Uh, so that we can use it to serve God. So the Ramam is stating that that can't possibly be the case, right? The world is here for its own purpose. Every being has a purpose. And God created a world so that every single thing that's within the world should be, um, uh, should fulfill its purpose. Okay. And this is, um, I also, I, I a couple of articles, really, uh, you know, much more modern articles, people that write on things like uh, 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 modern uh, ideas of, 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 of ecology and, and animal rights and things like that, use these ideas of the Ramam as a foundation, as a Jewish foundation for, for the ideas of respecting the world around us, that the world isn't here. And the Ramam directly refuted, as we read together, that, 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 that when it says, uh, you know, that we should dominate the earth, it doesn't mean that we dominate it because it's here for our purpose, but rather it means that that's what human beings can do, but not that we should do. <laughs> Right, we all studied that together. So I, I wanted to mention that, uh, but now let's do chapter fourteen. Um, I hope, I hope, hope, hope we can do fifteen tonight as well because I, I prepared a lot of cool stuff for fifteen. But let, let's see, fourteen. So page four fifty six. What man ought also to consider in order to know what his own soul is worth, and to make no mistake regarding this point. In other words, be humble, know what your true worth is. The Ramam says, keep this in mind. Um, is what has been made clear concerning the dimensions of the spheres and of the stars and the measures of the distance separating us from them. So, so the Ramam is going to say, and I'm going to go through this quick because this is, this is long defunct science, but which I want to bring out the point is very relevant today, but the actual science and the measurements. So he first starts by saying the distances between the, diam the diameter of the earth, the distance to the sphere of Saturn, which I don't remember which one it's sphere of Saturn is, but it's whatever sphere in in his cosmology the the planet Saturn rotated in, um, and uh, and it's to how many days it is. In other words, how many days it would take to walk the distance, um, uh, and so on. I, I, I skipped a couple sentences, and then he quotes the verse again from from Eov. The Ramam loved the Sefer Eov. He quotes from it a lot. Um, and is God not in the height of heaven? Uh, as, is not God in the height of heaven? And behold, the topmost of the stars, how high they are. In other words, look how high, how elevated God is. So this means, can you not draw? And then I'm reading at the, the bottom of the page. Can, can you not draw from the height of heaven a conclusion as to the remoteness of the apprehension of the deity? Right? Just look at the heaven and look at, at its simple vastness. Now, the Rama made a measurement, which we know today, the highs of the universe is 
gazillions, I mean, times more uh, to, uh, than he knew, right? So the, the relevance of the lesson is, if anything, greater today, right, uh, than, than it was back then, right? He's saying, if, if we are at such an extreme remoteness, if we're so far from Saturn, right, and, and so that its substance and most of its actions, we don't even understand what it's made of, what it, what it, what it does, why it does, right? How much more does that apply to God himself, who is not even a body, who is so beyond our comprehension? This great distance, and I just, I'm at the top of 457, that has been demonstrated is only a minimum. It is not possible that the distance between the center of the earth and a fixed star is be less, but it could be many times greater. In other words, I, the measurements that I said based on his current knowledge of, 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 of uh, astronomy says this is what we calculate to be the minimum distance, but we don't really know. It really might be much more, right? So Ramam, when we mentioned this many times, fully understood that scientific knowledge can advance, right? And he fully, he always leaves this little thing, it's, right? Because um, if the thickness of the spheres has only been demonstrated for its minimum possible dimensions and, and so on, if you want to read the uh, books about distances, the reading from the epistles concerning distances, generally it's impossible to determine exactly the thickness According to, uh, and he quotes Stabit, uh, you know, one of the one of the uh, astronomers of of those days. Reasoning forces us to admit between every two spheres. For in these bodies there are so so. I'm just kind of going through this. Uh, this is known for the measure of some of the stars. It's possible that it's even greater. The ninth sphere, which is the highest sphere, its dimension isn't even known at all because there's no star in it. Constantly, we have no way to measure it. So consider how vast and are the dimensions. So that Rama is really leaving place for modern science here and saying that it might be way vaster than I, we even know, right? And as we know now, it is, right? So um, how can one of us imagine? So this is the final sentence, and this is very relevant. The last sentence of this paragraph on 457, if the whole of the earth would not constitute even the smallest part of the sphere of the fixed stars, in other words, the size of the entire planet that we live on, is a teeny, teeny, tiny nothing in comparison to the size of the universe we see around us, right? What is the relation of the human species to all these creation things? In other words, we are just a tiny piece of this planet, right? And how can one of us imagine that they exist for his sake? How could we have the chutzpah and not uh, to think that we exist, that all this exists just for the tiny, tiny, tiny little us on this tiny, tiny, tiny little planet, right? And because of him, and that they are instruments for his benefit, and everything on this world and in this universe is here for us, how could you imagine such a thing? That's what the Ramam is saying here, right? It is, it's an instrument for our own humility, right? To understand that we're a tiny nothing in comparison to the universe, and to think that we're the purpose, it would be a tremendously arrogant thing to think. So then he goes on and he says, and he, remember, this is the second chapter, and he's attacking this idea, which is a very established idea in Jewish thought. I, I just quoted two of the greatest Jewish philosophers that disagreed with the Ramam on this. But Ramam is banging this point in because he's taking a very strong stance on this idea. This is the state of things when the bodies are compared, right? When we compare us to the, remember, he thought of the spheres of the stars as bodies. They're, they're things, right? They're spheres within which the stars are embedded. How then, when you think about the existence of the intellects, remember in Aristotelian physics, in order for something to move, there has to be a mind, an intellect saying move, right? Because that's how they he imagined, well, how do we make our body move? By thinking, move, right? I think, walk to the store and I walk to the store, right? So, so, um, so the intellects, right? Which the Ramam identifies as angels that, that decide and say to these spheres and the stars and the heavens, go, right? And make them move. How much more incredibly um, uh, sophisticated or powerful or, 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 or perfect they are than we, right? Sometimes doubts are expressed concerning the opinion of the philosophers in this matter. It is said, if we claim that the final end of the spheres consists in the governance of, uh, for instance, a human individual or several individuals. So some people think like this, right? If you say, it doesn't make sense to say that all those spheres exist so that me, Saul Weinreb, should exist. That's a little bit arrogant. But, however, in as much as we think of that, they're final, if it governs the human species, but all of humanity, okay, that's important. Maybe the whole universe exists for all of humanity. Maybe that's not so arrogant to think that way. Maybe that's possible, right? There is no absurdity in thinking that the final end of this great individual body is the existence of the individuals of the various species, the number of which individuals cannot, according to their doctrine, ever have an end. Because remember, the people thinking this are Aristotelians. 
think that humans have always been and will always be. So there's an infinite number of human beings. So maybe it all exists for that. It would resemble a case of an artisan. He says, you have iron tools weighing 100 whatever pounds or whatever the, the measurement is, right? And he uses all of those tools to make a tiny needle, right? So if it was done for the sake of one needle, this would have been bad management from a certain speculation. In other words, as a business dis uh, uh, decision, that's quite dumb. You have the, this huge amount of equipment to make a needle, right? However, but in view of the fact that with these tools, he manufactures one after another and, and thus several hundred weights of needles, then it makes it makes a good sense. It's good management. In other words, you, you made a bazillion needles and now you sold it and you made a lot of money. It makes sense, right? Similarly, the final end of the spheres, right, consists in the continuance of coming to be and passing away. All of it makes the world continue to go on and all the species and the human species to constantly come into existence, right? And we can find texts and traditions that support this imagining. I can show you, and Ramam is hinting, that you can find verses in the Torah and Chazal that seem to suggest that this is correct. And he's not going to bring those things. But however, in the, I'm starting the second paragraph on 458, the philosopher will resolve the doubt by saying, if the difference between the bodies of the spheres and the individuals that are subject to generation and corruption, <coughs> right, can on, had only consisted in their bigness and smallness, then you can say this objection, right? You can say that, you know what? Everything does exist for human beings. The fact that these, these, um, the spheres are so much larger than us, in other words, if when you measure them, in other words, the universe is so huge and we're so tiny. So that doesn't prove anything because there's an infinite number of humans. Humans always existed, always will exist. And there's a hundred million of us now, there's a hundred billion of us in 10 years from now and 20 years and 20,000 years, right? So if you add all the humans, there's a lot. So that's that you can you can kind of get away with that. Then you might have a logical way out. However, seeing the difference between them concerning the nobleness of substance, the greatness, the awesome power and might that exists, that is the universe. Today, we wouldn't call it necessarily, um, uh, you know, the intellects, right? Remember the, what we see as moving the world and making the universe, so to speak, move. We see all of the forces of nature, the incredible amount of force of nature that a tiny little uh, atomic particle has contained within it, right? And you compare that with our puny little selves, the entire mass and power of the entire universe. To say that would be, as Ramam says, it would have been most disgraceful if what is nobler served as an instrument for the existence of what is most base and vile. Okay, that's the end of that 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 second chapter. In other words, we're we're in his words, we're base and vile. To think that all of this exists for us just doesn't work. It doesn't hold up. Okay, <laughs> to sum up, this doubt, and I, I am the the end of the the end of this chapter ends in something really cool too. So this is this is a really good one. This doubt may be called upon to help us in our belief concerning the production of the world in time, which notion was my main object in this chapter. The fact is, is that I believe the world was was created, right? And it was created so that the entire universe should exist exactly the way it exists. Every single thing was made so that it should exist. You and I were made so that you and I should exist, but so was my cat and so was the cow marching around the field and so was the lion in Africa, right? They were all made so that they should exist, right? And um, besides there is the fact that I've always heard from all those who have some smattering of, of knowledge of the science of astronomy that what Chazal said, right? Uh, regarding distances are exaggerated. Uh, so, he, so he goes, well, this from this sentence, besides, he goes off on a little tangent, which is really interesting. But there's also, I want to mention something else Ramam says. Besides, there is this fact, right? That if you look through Chazal, they have clearly stated, and I'm going to just really paraphrase. You can go through the rest of the chapter yourself. He, he brings the, their distances, Chazal's distances, right? And they measure different distances than I did when I was quoting the current modern, in my mom's day, modern uh, uh, astronomical treatises that he quoted from that calculated the distances in the stars. I, I must skip that part mostly too, right? But when you look through Chazal, they had different measurements. So I'm going up to the top of page 459. So, um, uh, and I, you can, I'm just going to read, do not ask me to show this, the beginning of the second paragraph on 459, the last paragraph of chapter 14. So, so people will argue with me and say, you just told me the distances are like this. But Chazal, the, in the Gemara, you find different distances measured. So one point that he made is, 
it doesn't matter. The bottom, the point is the same. Chazal's distances were greater than the distances that he measured, right? But the point, the idea that he taught doesn't change according to Chazal. But then again, don't bother me, the Ramam is about to state, with the fact that my modern science contradicts what's written in the Gemara, right? Don't bother me with such nonsense because of the following. For at that time of Chazal, mathematics was imperfect, were imperfect, right? Their, their math that, that they had access to in the time of the Gemara wasn't as good as our math, right? They did not speak about this as transmitters of dicta of the prophets. When Chazal taught us the distances of the, their astronomical measurements, they were not teaching us what, the, what they learned out of the Torah or the Tanakh, but rather because in those times they were men of knowledge in these fields. And, you know, they, they, they knew astronomy based on their times, right? Or because they had heard these dicta from the men of knowledge who lived in this, or they went to the, the Chazal the equivalent of the university and asked the scientists then to tell me how big the distances were. And this is what they thought, right? Because of this, I will not say with regard to the dicta of theirs, which as we find corresponds to the truth, that they were incorrect or have been said fortuitously. I'm not going to bother telling you that they were wrong because they weren't wrong based on what they knew. That's what they, that was the best of their knowledge. Now we know better. Our mathematics are more advanced. So now we know different, right? They weren't teaching us anything that comes from Tanakh. So um, for whenever it is possible to interpret the words of an individual in such a manner that they conform to a being whose existence has been demonstrated, if, if, if you can show me something that Chazal say that does conform to reality, great, right? That's fine. That's wonderful. It's always better to do that when you can. But this is the conduct that is most fitting and most suitable for an equitable man of excellent nature. If you're a decent, uh, as a normal, intelligent human being, if a person say, could, could respond, and then you say yes, because it's better to say about, don't say that Chazal were wrong, just say that they did it based on the best knowledge that they had available at the time. And th this paragraph of, of the Ramam is one which uh, is, of course, became very famous in the, um, the, the famous uh, Rabbi Natan Slifkin affair. Where, where he was attacked for writing this basic idea that the Ramam emphatically states and very clearly states over here that when Chazal states scientific facts, they're stating it based on the best knowledge that they had available to them at the time. And they weren't, and, it, and it's not, it's, it, in fact, and as the Ramam just stated here, it's respectful of us not to say that they were wrong, but it's much more respectful of us to say that they said what they knew based on the best of their knowledge. And, and this is uh, the Ramam's approach. We, we, we came across hints to this several times, but here is where he says it most clearly and most emphatically that, um, that it's okay for me to disagree with Chazal's distances. So, so the point of this chapter was, there was two points, the main point and this little tangent that he just went on. The main point being that, that, that the awesome vastness of the universe should impress us to, to the fact that we as human beings cannot possibly be the purpose of existence. Right. And the second idea was this this idea that don't don't bother me with contradictions between my science and the science of Chazal in, in the Gemara. Let's I'm going to open the floor before I do chapter 15 to, to questions or well, comments. I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask about the most base and vile. I mean, if you start from that assumption, presumption, assessment, yeah. that uh, where uh, humans are base and vile. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, where does he come up with that conclusion? I didn't see. Well, that. well, well. What he really means there is, is, is first of all, vile in comparison to the great intellects that run the, the, okay. the heavens, right? And, and, and in the sense that we have this matter. Remember, a couple chapters ago, I forget which one, he talked about how human beings are made of form and matter, and because our matter is, 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 is dirt, right, right. Uh, uh, so, so we therefore. Uh, sometimes tend to go after the, those things that that our, our matter desires, you know, our physical desires and so on, you know. And so so in that sense, we're vile. And he says that the way we're supposed to perfect that is with our intellect. So but if you know, had access to the periodic table and uh, atomic theory and atoms and neutron and electron, uh, maybe he wouldn't think of us as dirt. But uh, no, no, well, well, no, because because uh, remember, he had four elements, right? Right. If he, if he, you know, obviously the, the, the idea, the question of what the Rambam would have said if, right, everyone loves to say that. And every group of Jews that has ever existed since the Rambam passed away claimed, with the exception of those who criticized him, 
for a little bit. But once he achieved status as 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 the uh, as as in the um, pantheon, well, that's not the right word in the uh, canon of Jewish uh, world, right? Uh, every group claims to have the Rambam as the guy that they back. I mean, you know, if you talk to a guy in Chabad, they would swear that the Rambam would fo- be following the Rebbe or something. If you talk to a guy in, you know, the reform movement, but, but the Rambam would wake up from his bed and say that what you follow the Rebbe, calling him the Mashiach, is exactly the opposite of what I said in in the Laws of Kings. All right. Well, well, uh, um, I don't disagree, but but uh, but you know, and but every movement within Judaism, from the all the way to the right to all the way to the left, claim the Rambam as their own. So what he would have said is a very difficult question, but I don't think it would be. I think it's pretty accurate to say that that and the Ramam emphatically always follows where the evidence leads him. So if there's scientific evidence that something is true, the Ramam would absolutely accept it. And he stated that over and over again. Right. If there's something that either through logic has to be true or through through, um, you know, scientific experiment has been demonstrated. That's what the Ramam uses when his equivalent of experiment, obviously he was pre-scientific revolution. So it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to him as it means to us, but something that has been demonstrated to be true, right? Um, you know, the Rambam would absolutely accept that. He would never say, oh, that that science is not true because of something, you know, that, that I think that's pretty clear. Um, you know, and, and in regard to how he approaches when Chazal make mistakes in science, he just made it eminently clear. Despite this, I have heard on so many occasions people claim that the Ramam doesn't say this, uh, and it, it, it's it's mind-boggling, right? Because they can't accept that the Ram. It's you know, you why don't just admit that he says what he says, and you don't like it, fine, or quote somebody else and say you you agree with the other guy. But to deny what the Ramam said is to me it's 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 sacrilegious. I mean, it, it's just you know, this is what he said. If you don't like it, you know, that's your problem. But anyway, regardless, this is. You know, so this is the foundation of understanding. Like, you know, if Chazal understood things scientifically in any way, and we now know it's not that way, this Ramam just told us exactly what we're supposed to do with that contradiction. And that, that's what the purpose of this book is, the guide for the perplexed, right? Thus, people that want to believe in the Torah, don't want to let go of the Torah because we believe in it. But we also find contradictions and problems. And this is one of those problems, you know, when science can contra- scientific fact contradicts what the... Has what our what our rabbinic leadership and that they teach us. Okay, so anyway, so let's hit chapter fifteen uh, on page four fifty nine. Um, chapter fifteen is is a um, um, addresses the impossible. So um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna I want to go off on a little tangent. I'm gonna I have to give credit where credit is due. And I, I mentioned this a long time ago, probably. A, well over a year ago, I mentioned this podcast that I li- like to listen to sometimes called Judaism Demystified. And like, I don't know, a year or two ago, they had a guy named Rabbi Matt Schneeweiss, who um, who uh, I was introduced to in this podcast. I, I didn't know, and he, he he doesn't claim to be an expert philosopher or anything, but he he has some cool lectures that he's given on the topic of can God do the impossible, right? So, um, so it was just a, it, it, it's it's a really fun, uh, mind bending, mind twisting uh, uh, podcast if you want to listen to it. But I want to give him credit because a lot of my understanding of this issue came from that podcast. So, um, so, so the the question is, <laughs> if something is impossible, scientifically impossible, can God do it? Okay, is it can God do it? So, um, so on, uh, so the famous question is. The, the one that the philosophers debated over the centuries was, was uh, well, it comes in two famous forms. One is, can God make a triangle in which the diagonal is the equal distance to the, to the sides, right? Can God make such a triangle, right? So the Raman will mention that particular one. The other question is, can God make a rock that is impossible for him to, too heavy for him to lift, right? So, so the 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 it, it, you, you get cognitive dissonance just thinking about this question, right? Because um, because uh, if God makes a if, if you say that God can't make such a triangle or can't make such a rock, then you're limiting God, right? Because you're saying He can't do something, right? If you if you say that He can do it, then He makes a rock that's immovable. Now there's something that God can't do because He can't move the rock, right? 
so 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 it's it's a it's it's you you, you get into this mind bending um thing so i'm going to make a few so 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 billy you said the question is nonsensical and thank you for saying that and you're 100% right and i'm going to i'm going to say that in a minute uh, basically so i appreciate you you jumped ahead of me but but so, so there's there's several responses that we need to understand to that question that are just simple logic right and 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 they're not. This is not. These are not religious ideas. These are philosophical ideas. Uh, but they're very relevant to what we're about to learn in the Rambam. And I'm going to tell you right now that Rambam is about to tell us emphatically, and you can even see it in just the first few uh, sentences if you look. That the answer, according to the Rambam, is no. Right? God cannot do the impossible. And it's going to step into um, into philosophical questions too. Right? Like uh, more more than just can he make this mythical rock or a triangle? Right? But but it, it goes into more foundational questions of the nature of God Himself, which we'll get to soon. So so the four points that I want to make, uh, and I got these direct, directly from this Rabbi Schneeweis, um, are, are as follows. The, the first thing is is that um, perfect. Wh why do we have a problem when we ask this question? Right? What, what's the problem with this question? Uh, because because either way we're limiting god right we're, we're making a limitation we're making him somehow less somehow worse somehow less perfect right if we limit him and since since we have this notion that we can't limit him right therefore um the question becomes it confuses us because we can't have an answer so he said however if you think about it even when you call god perfect you're making a limitation because if he's perfect then he can't be imperfect so you just made a limitation right so limiting God and saying that he can't do the impossible is not a limitation. It's impossible, right? Right? It, it's, it's simply impossible. So you, you can't, um, you can't, uh, so, so that, that's the first thing that you need to know, right? The second th thing that you need to know is that, um, is that, is that it's, it, the question itself is absurd, right? So, so in, in another example that philosophers like to play with is the following, and, and kind of this question, you can illustrate it a little better. Can, can, what happens if an unstoppable force meets an immovable object, right? So again, your, your mind is bent. So the, the, the thing is like this, the question is in itself a paradox, right? It can't, the question is totally nonsensical, right? Because, because um, which is really what Billy was saying, right? And that is, why is that? Because, because if, an un, if, if the unstoppable force could move the immovable object, right? Then it's not an immovable object right if the unstoppable force can't move the immovable object then it's not an unstoppable force right so the question you don't have to answer a question that makes no sense in the first place right so it's the same thing when you ask such questions about god can god do the impossible right the question itself is a paradox right so the whole question falls away so there's no purpose in answering it the third point that he made and you'll see what i mean all these three points will help four points will help us when we go through this chapter that the answer is is no he can't do the impossible why because if he could do the impossible then it wouldn't be impossible it's possible right so he, he gave the example imagine you have two big giant buckets in one bucket you throw the impossible things and the other bucket you throw the possible things right and the triangle is in the the the, the this weird triangle is in the impossible and this big rock and these impo um, 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 immovable objects they're all in the impossible box and then God does it. Well, now it's not impossible anymore. So it goes into the possible box, right? So, so the, again, it, the question is nonsensical in the first place, right? And the fourth point he makes is that, and this is also really important, is that, is that um, what we seem to think that when we say you can't do something, and he, he, he said, makes this as a psychological uh, point. When we're children, right, right, and, and we want to, do something and our mom says no you can't right we think that that's bad right when when someone says you can't do something well that you're limiting right you're limiting that's a bad thing he says we you know but we that, that's just it's this childish psychological idea that sits in our brains our entire lives that we think when you say something that someone can't do something that that's a limitation that that's somehow making somebody less powerful less good less perfect but it's not true a limitation that's based on something being impossible that's not bad it's just impossible it's like if your mom tells you you can't uh you know you know fly to 
I mean, nowadays, maybe you could fly to Mars, but you can't fly to Pluto, right? right? It's impossible. Maybe one day they'll figure out technology, but right now you can't, right? So, 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 so you're, it's not a limitation. It's just, it's just a fact, right? So anyway, those are four points that I think are important to, to, rec- to see, because then now we're going to see Rambam's discussion of can God do the impossible? So the impossible, Rambam says, is a stable nature. In other words, when it's a, it's a rule of nature that this is impossible. One whose stability is constant and is not made by a maker. It is impossible to change it in any way. It's not impossible because God made it impossible, but otherwise it's just scientifically, it's just impossible, right? And and um, the reason why, in theory, right, because Raman believes in a creator and things are impossible usually because of a scientific rule that says that such a thing is impossible, such as the scientists of geometry saying that such a triangle is impossible, Right. It's and it's conceivable that God could have created a different universe in which the rules of science would have been different. Right. That might be conceivable. However, right. You'll see in a minute why the Ramam is saying that the impossible is impossible because it's impossible. And it's not because God made it this way. Right. Uh, because uh, hence and the power over the maker of the impossible is not attributed to the deity. It's not impossible because God made it impossible. It's impossible because it is. Now that might sound a little on the edge for a minute, but hold hold with the Rambam for a minute because you'll understand it soon. This is a point about which none of the men of speculation differs in any way. And none but those who do not understand the intelligibles is ignorant of this. The people that don't get this are just ignorant, right? Which is, we've heard the Rambam dismiss people like that before. The point about which there is difference of opinion among all the men of speculation concerns a certain species of imaginable things. People do argue over certain things that you can imagine, and then you wonder, is this really possible or is this really impossible, right? With regard to which one of the men says they belong to the class of impossible things regarding which that power to change them cannot be attributed to the deity. So in other words, since they're impossible, they're impossible. Whereas the other says, no, it belongs to the class of possible things, depending on the power of the deity to be brought into existence when he wills. In other words, I think this is possible and you think it's impossible. We can argue about that. You and I can uh, come up with an, uh, is it possible for a human being to run a certain speed that, whatever. So you could say it's impossible. I could say it's possible and then we could debate it, right? But, But if it's actually impossible, then it's impossible. Thus, for example, the coming together. Now, this the next thing Rama is going to list scientific rules that you and I are familiar with because we've been studying this book together. But these are not scientific rules that are based on modern science. They're scientific rules based on Aristotelian science. So, so I'm just going to go through them quickly. The com- but, but one of them is relevant. The coming together of contraries at the same instant, like something being hot and cold at the same time, right? Or something being fast and slow at the same time. It, it can't, they're, they're, they're opposites. And at the same place in transmutation substance, I mean, the transformation of a substance into an accident. Remember, an accident, I don't like the term accident. And, and by the way, in the new translation, they still use the term accident, <laughs> the one that you guys sent me. But but I have been starting to use it. It's absolutely wonderful, by the way. And I, I've used it a lot of the notes. They, they, they're just really, it's really good. And the only reason why I'm not using it is because everyone in this class bought this and because this is the one that I'm used to. But um, but uh, but I am I have been using it as a reference. But but uh, but but uh, but I use instead of accident as a characteristic, right? So in Aristotelian philosophy, a substance is made of something, and then certain characteristics uh, are intrinsically combined with it to make it into the thing, right? That it is. So so and so you can't have a something without a characteristic. Everything. So the dirt has this characteristic. It feels a certain way. It's a certain moisture or whatever it is. The table has a certain character. You can't have the substance of the table without the, the characteristics, the accidents that attribute to it, or the existence of a corporeal substance without there being an, uh, an accident in it. All these things belong to the class of the impossible, right? Because they defy the rules of science as was known to the Rambam in his day, right? So um, likewise, so now here, here's, here's the key sentence now. So why is it that even God didn't make things impossible, right? Not because he couldn't have made a different universe with different scientific rules, but because the what things are truly impossible, the following things, God should, likewise, that God should bring into existence someone like himself. Can God create another God? Let's say God decided I'm getting lonely. I want there to be another God. Could God do that, right? Um, and, I, I, and Or should annihilate him. Let's say God says, you know what? I'm sick and tired of all of this. I want to not exist anymore, right? So let's say God wants to annihilate himself. 
or should become a body or God should say, I'm not going to be a God anymore. I want to be a person now. Right. And this is this is a direct shot at a certain religion. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, and the commentaries note that. But it's incomprehensible. It's philosophically inconceivable because God is beyond this universe. He's something other, something different. He can't become a body. Right. Or should change or God should somehow decide to change his nature in some way, shape or way. All of these things belong to the class of the impossible. And the power to do any of these things cannot be attributed to God. We can't say that God could do any of these things. Now, why is it? What do these four things have in, in common? All those four things, right? The, what they have in common is that they, they fundamentally, right? If God could make another God, like if you would posit that if God that's decided to make another one, then he could, then God wouldn't be God anymore, right? Because the whole concept of God is the unity of God. There's only one, right? It, 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 you could, if you decide to be a polytheist and believe in 10 gods, fine, go be a polytheist, right? But, but, but assuming that you're accepting the premise of, 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 of this monotheistic religion that we're studying here, right? That then, then, then once you posit logically that God could make another one, then you're not believing in God anymore. Right. Then there's no then then you just eliminated the concept of God. Right. The same thing with annihilate himself. God always is, always was, always will be. That's a central tenet of what the definition of God is. So if God were to make a time when he's no longer around. Right. Then then he's not God. Right. And the same thing with the third one. Right. If the whole point of God is that he's completely is, is that he's a concept that you and I cannot comprehend. Right. We, we, a human being, our human mind can't comprehend God because he's of a totally different substance, something that we can't even imagine, right? So if he could become a man, if he could be, if he could become some some uh, body in this un, in this in this underworld that we live in, then then he wouldn't be God. Or if God could change, the whole point of God is that he's immutable, he's not unchangeable, he doesn't change, he always is, always was, so on and so forth. So any of those things. Are impossible and they're not impossible because God said one day, right? This is going to be impossible, right? They're impossible because if they did exist, then there wouldn't be God, right? Then God wouldn't be who He is. So the very essence of 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 God says that God cannot do those things. So if something is absolutely impossible, which are those four things that He just mentioned, then they're just impossible because they are. And that's the point that Raman was trying to make. Okay, so um, so uh, regarding the question whether he is able to bring into existence an accident that exists alone, not in a substance. These are going back to the argument about about those scientific rules, right? That he had, right? Or um, namely, uh, a group among the men of speculation, namely the Mutazila, some Islamic thinker group, a, a philosophical uh, school. They have imagined this and held that it is possible, or others have asserted that it is impossible. It is true that those who assert that an accident may exist without a substance, they're not led to this affirmation by speculation alone, but they wish to safeguard thereby certain doctrines of the law that are violently rebutted by speculation. Thus, the assertion in question was a way out for them. And it doesn't pay to go into the arguments of these philosophers. So, But he's basically saying, so they argue that it is possible and the others argue that it's not possible, right? Similarly, the bringing into the being of a corporeal thing out of no matter whatsoever belongs, according to us, to the class of the possible, right? We think that it is possible to create the world, yesh mayayin, because God did it, right? It's not something that you or I can do. Right? It's like like if you had an, if prior to creation, right, that, that sentence obviously is nonsensical to Maimonides, but I'm going to say it anyway. You had these two buckets. And in one bucket, it said, make something out of nothing, Right? Uh, so that was in the impossible bucket until the Big Bang or whatever you want to call it, the moment of creation, right? Now, all of a sudden, it's possible because God just did it. So it's not in the impossible bucket, right? So the philosophers say similarly that to bring into being a square whose diagonal is equal to one of its sides. That's the thing that I said before. Or a corporeal angle encompassed by four plane <coughs> angles or other similar things belong, all of them, to the class of the impossible. Some of those who are ignorant of mathematics and concerning these matters, know only the words by themselves and do not conceive of their notion, think that they are possible. So the Ram is saying those other things that are impossible because they they violate the, the basic laws of nature, like the this diagonal of a triangle, are impossible because they because they are. 
Would that I knew whether this gate is open and listen <coughs> so that everyone can claim and assert with regard to any notion. I just started the second paragraph on 460. So to regarding any notion, whatever that he conceives, this is possible. Whereas someone else says, no, this is impossible because of the nature of, of the matter, right? Right. The fact is that I don't know, right? The Ramam is saying, right? I don't know uh, the answer to every single one of these questions, right? Which is possible and which is not. Or is there something that shuts and blocks this gate so that a man can assert decisively that such and such a thing is impossible because of its nature? Should this be verified and examined with the help of the imaginative faculty or with the intellect, right? Do we try to imagine such things? And if we can imagine them, then they must be able to be possible. Or, or, or do we think it through? The intellect meaning, do we scientifically think it through, logically think it through and see if it will work? And by what can one differentiate between that which is imagined and that which is cognitive of the intellect? If you can dream something, I, I can dream about a dragon flying through a, a rainbow and a butterfly. Or I can dream all kinds of things. Does that is how does that match up with what's real? What could happen? Could there be a dragon? Could it fly through a rainbow? Well, I don't know, right? For an individual, sometimes disagrees with someone else or with himself. You know, we disagree with ourselves. One day I think it's possible, the next day I think it's impossible. With regard to the thing that isn't really possible, that he asserts the idea is possible. Whereas the objective, the other guy says this assertion that it is possible is where, and the other guy says you're using your imagination, you're dreaming this up. It can't be, right? Um, and not due to consideration by the intellect, right? You can think about any argument you've had with any intractable argument you've had with anybody where some one guy said, you know, and it's all bounces around this. And the other guy says, eh, it can't be, it's not true. The, the, the data doesn't back it up, right? Is that something altogether outside both the intellect and the imagination? Or is it completely unimaginable? Or is it by the intellect itself that one distinguishes between that which is cognized by the intellect and that which is imagined? All these are points of investigation, which may lead very far. If you want to go down those paths, go right ahead, right? You have my permission, the Rambam says, to spend all the time you want and debate whatever subject you want to debate and do whatever research you want to do. However, this is not the object of this chapter. I, I made my point, right? I'm not, I'm not here to speculate on how to achieve world peace tomorrow or whatever else it is that you want to argue about. It has then become clear, and the Rambam ends this chapter as follows. It has then become clear. That according to every opinion in school, there are impossible things whose existence cannot be admitted. The bottom line is, if something is impossible, then it really is, right? Power to bring them about cannot be ascribed to the deity. We cannot say that God can do it, right? And now if you think back to those arguments that I stated, right? The Ramam is emphatically saying that to say, right, that God can't do impossible things is not in any way, shape, or form a limitation in, 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 or, or deficiency in God. The fact that he does not change them signifies neither inability nor deficiency of power on his part, right? Right, because th that, that you know, don't think that because I said he can't do the impossible that somehow that's a deficiency in God. It's not a deficiency, it's just impossible, right? Accordingly, there are they are necessarily as they are and are not due to the act of an agent. It has then become clear that the point with regard to which there is disagreement concerns the things that could be supposed to belong to either two classes and either the things that we could debate are which things are really impossible, right? So I don't know, nowadays, maybe some theoretical physicist can explain how you can make a triangle with the, I don't know, maybe somebody can, maybe somebody can't, I don't know. Certainly according to basic geometry, it's impossible. The, uh, you know, whether they belong to the class of the possible or to the class of the impossible, learn this. So just learn this, right? And now you can go and argue with whoever you want to, however long you want to, be my guest, have a good time, right? But uh, don't bother God with all this nonsense. Um, and so this is this is the uh, end of this chapter, which I personally thought was a lot of fun. But um, you're going to see this entire third book. I promise I, I, every single one is full of gems. So, um, so uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing you guys next week. But if there's any questions or comments, then now's the time. Uh, yeah, I have a, a comment. Uh, so yeah. the, there's a listener to this. Uh, he, I've been spending the last 20 minutes trying to figure out when you said a square, a, 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 a triangle which is equal to one, uh, equal to one of its sides. But I yeah. see the quote here from Maimonides. He was talking about a square. Square, right. Diagonal, it's equal to one of its sides. Yeah, but it's the same thing. If you remember basic geometry, a square yeah. that you draw a diagonal, you just made two triangles. It's it's the right. same. But, but, so so it's, it's the diagonal of the square that is equal to one of the sides of the square, right. not that the diagonal of the triangle 
is equal to one of the sides. I couldn't figure out when you said a diagonal. I was using the triangle thing because when you read through a lot of the old, when you read through all basic philosophy books, they like love to debate this question, right? Oh, okay. so so some use the triangle example and some use it. It's the same question though, because if you draw, if you have a square, right? And then you draw a triangle uh, line through it. I, and you yeah, just, diagonal of a square. I understand right, what a diagonal right, of a square right, is, right, but okay. I didn't understand what a diagonal of a triangle was. What is well, a diagonal of a triangle? It, it's it's the long line. <laughs> if I'm using the oh, wrong geometric term, forgive oh, I me. I see. That, that was the okay. Okay. The long was, line that's longer by definition than the shorter line. The size of the triangle. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you. Right. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, Jeff. Um, hi. Um, I was thinking about this idea that you know God can't change Himself, right, as an impossibility. Right. And then I was thinking the idea that God is, but we God is one. Mm -hmm. Um. One of the understandings of God is one is that everything is God. Everything that exists is God, right? This idea of the, the unity of the universe is God. And so if God were to change himself in one of those ways that suggested, it seems to me that that would then entail, it would no longer be the same universe, right? The whole um, universe would be different. Like our, our, the, the, every this this reality wouldn't be here anymore because God would have changed, and if God changes, then everything changes. Well, first of all, I want to tell you that you're making you're starting with one mistake, right? And that no, is, I, your, I, if it's just one, I'm very impressed. Okay, no, no, but it's one that leads to others. The Rambam doesn't use that terminology describing everything as God. That's the idea certainly exists within Judaism, right? Um, especially in the mystical schools, right? But, um, but uh, and s some find some hints of like a little bit of a pantheism, like Spinoza also took that, that idea to a large degree from Rambam and then ran with it in a different direction. But, um, but that the concept that everything is God is just, it's not really a Maimonidean concept. So, um, so um, you know, and the Rambam doesn't deal with the big question that that which is really the foundation that started that kicked off the, ca the Kabbalistic movement, right? Which is right. If God, right? How could how could there be existing things that exist that are not God, right? Right. So how could we exist? And and the, the concept of Tzimtzum and things like that, and th that's what really gave birth to the Kabbalah. But Ramam doesn't doesn't really deal with that question. You know, he doesn't seem to have a problem with the fact that the universe that we live in is separate from God. Um, you know, he, he, the way the, the way the Ramam sees it is God is a creator who made it all right. And, and, and is the ultimate power that runs it all. And he described how God's emanations through the various spheres, you know, emanate from one sphere to the next sphere to the next sphere until it gets down to us and is the energy that powers it all. But he doesn't seem to have a problem with the fact that we're separate. So that that's the mistake, um, uh, and it's just not. Uh, yeah, it's so it is a very pervasive and important idea in Judaism, but it's not really a Maimonidean idea. Does that, that so? I kind of pulled the water out of your question, <laughs> pulled the carpet out from under it. <laughs> I was just trying to square the circle, so to speak. Yeah, but sometimes we can't. Like there are. There are circles in Jewish thought that can't be squared, you know, because uh, th there's these are different schools of thought, you know. When people think that you know, it's, there's these are, I mean, this we just saw, heard today this idea. What's the per really it's the fundamental idea? What's the purpose of the universe, right? So we have a Sadjagon or a Benubachi on one side and Rambam on the other side. Certainly, all extremely important figures in the history of Jewish thought, saying completely opposite ideas, you know. Um, and, you know, when, when people joke around, you know, what's the purpose of the universe, you know? Well, that's a, if it's not a, as being asked as a joke, it's a serious question. And they have two very different answers. You know, I, I, I want to mention Ram, Ramam's answer is important for a lot of reasons. And it's going to become more and more important as we read through book three. It's important because, first of all, you know, it doesn't, it, 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 Ramam explained to us today, it doesn't make sense to say that this entire universe exists just for us. But more than that, because of the Maimonidean concept of God, 
because Ramam emphasizes so much that we can't affect God. It also doesn't make sense. And he's going to say this later. I can't remember which chapter, but um, that it doesn't make sense that he would create a world for the purpose of us worshiping him. Because what does God need our worship for? Right. He doesn't gain anything from us. Right. So why would he make a world simply in order that we should something? So the Ramam says, you don't ask such questions. Right. right. He told us, do not. He told us in chapter 13, do not ask that question. Right. <laughs> Right. It's not a question. What's the purpose? The, God decided to make a world. That's it. We don't need to know the purpose. Right. And we will never know the purpose. He made the world the way it is. Right. Deal with it. Right. And, and, and do the right thing because we have this intellect that we're supposed to use and, and live in a certain way. But but um, but not but that but that's not the reason why God made the world. Right. You know, he, that was uh, it was that was twelve and thirteen where he emphasized that. So, but Rabbeinu Bachi would give you a very different answer, right? Uh, and and the Sadugon would give you a very different answer. They would say, no, the world was created so that the human beings should come and worship God, and we should live this Torah lifestyle and and worship and pray and do mitzvot and everything. Uh, that's why this world was created. Imagine though the different conclusions that you make when you look at the rest of the world that's around you. Whether you take a Maimonidean approach versus a Rabbeinu Bachia approach, and you get you get a very different approach to the world, you know. Um, and remember again, it's just so fascinating how the Rambam admits he throws in these little things. And I know you can find some verses that sound like those other guys, but don't worry, I got it, <laughs> you know, because he already gave us instructions about how to learn those verses. Well, can I just well, ask the, the thing yeah. you just mentioned in passing is very fundamental. I mean, what difference does it make? Well, since we have the Torah, it really doesn't make any difference. But um, is, is that the reason it doesn't make any difference? Because we have the Torah? Because of the Torah, it tells us how to live. And what more do we need to know than how to live? Um, we need to know how to live, but not why we're living. But, yeah, I mean, but Maimonides is saying that's not a question we should ask. Why? Would well, right, because the answer to why is ultimately always going to be the same because God willed it so, right? God made the universe how it is because he decided to do it. We will never be able to know why he decided to do it. He could just as easily have continued existing and not made a world, right? But he decided to make, or he could have made a world different than the one we see, but he made this one. And, and asking the question of why he decided to do it is we'll never know the answer. So just, you know, just don't bother, you know. Well, we not, can well, go we'll back talk, to the quote. We'll return to that, whether no, what, what, why, it's, why that, that's relevant. For example, if God, some people say God needed a companion. So it makes a difference. If you think you're a companion to God, it gives you a certain status uh, that otherwise would be lacking. Just remember what the Ramam said in the beginning of 13. One of the minds, often the minds of perfect men have grown perplexed over the question of what is the final end of that which exists, right? <laughs> then he went on a whole long thing, which took us two weeks to do. And in the end, he said, let me find that. Um, uh, I want to find that sentence. <clears throat> this view... Um, Thus it says that the Lord had made everything lemaanehu, right? Our first interpret would be for the sake of his essence may be exalted. That is for the sake of his will as the latter is his essence according to what has been made clear in the treatise, right? Um, there's one sentence I, I, I want to remember. Um, Thus, we are obliged to believe that all that exists was intended by him according to his volition. And we shall seek for it no cause or other final end what, whatever. Just as we do not seek for the end of his existence may be exalted, so we do not seek for the final end of his volition, right? His will, right? According to which all that has been and will be produced in time comes into being as it is. And be not misled in your soul to think that the spheres and angels have been brought into existence for our sake. I mean, that, that, that was a couple of weeks ago we read that. What page was that? What was the page of that? 450, the bottom of 454 and top of 455. And that was his conclusion when he started several pages prior asking the big question, right? The question of what is the final end of that which exists? So his answer is, not for you. <laughs> and Because and, God decided to make a world like this. 
right? Anyway, um, any other comments before we close up? All right, so looking forward to next week. All right, this is great. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for joining. Thanks. Yeah. All right.